don't think uh, I don't think this would be a great passage to make everybody stand up and read the whole thing. Uh, this is the genealogies of Christ, uh, but just turn there, and I'm going to start preaching, and we'll be there here in just a few minutes. I want to talk about um, these women who are mentioned in the lineage of Christ. Now, I have been preaching a series in Ruth, and we're departing from that series, but Ruth's going to be in here because everybody probably knows she is in the lineage of, of Christ. And so, in fact, the end of Ruth, the, the very end of the book, talks about how David comes from, uh, from that, that line there. So, in fact, there are five women mentioned here in the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, they're not mentioned in Luke. It's just kind of interesting, but they are mentioned in Matthew. I mean, it's the same genealogy up until a certain point, uh, actually, where uh, to the line of David, they're the same. And then Matthew's telling uh, Mary's genealogy, Luke's telling, I'm sorry, the other way around, uh, Matthew's telling uh, Joseph's genealogy, Luke is telling Mary's genealogy, and they go up until David, both of them, and then where they split off there uh, with Solomon, you know, and the, the two different tribes and all that kind of stuff, there's a, some split off at that point. So uh, both the lineage of David, and then it goes on uh, from there. So, so Ruth's in there. Uh, we're going to see Tamar, who I've mentioned recently in a message as well. Uh, Rahab, the harlot, and Bathsheba. And then, of course, Mary, the mother of, of Jesus. Now, these are women, as we're going to see here in a minute, who aren't really what you would think would be in the lineage of Christ. In fact, Tonight, I want to preach, or I'm going to start this afternoon, and then it's kind of like a two-part message uh, that we'll finish up tonight here. But um, this afternoon, I'm going to start talking about the women who aren't mentioned in the genealogy that are, they're there, but they're just not really mentioned. And if you really put those two together, you think like, well, why, why isn't Eve mentioned? Why isn't Sarah, Abraham's, you know, why aren't these people mentioned? Why, do, why does it start with people who, who are just, you know, would almost be like the ones in the line that you'd be like, hey, we don't want to talk about them. You know, like, how many have actually done a genealogy? I know Miss uh, J- Miss uh, Joyce, I think. Didn't you do look into your genealogy at the library a little bit? I know a few people here. I know my mom worked on that a little bit. Miss Linda did. Uh, you know, I wonder how many of you have a, a, some relative that was married to Joseph Smith. <laughs> A lot of times, like, you trace your lineage back and people have that story or there's a couple of different other things that, uh, that seem to pop up a lot. You know, everybody's related to Jesse Jones, uh, I mean, Jesse James or something like that. You know, there's all kinds of uh, similarities. But, you know, there are certain ones in the family that just a little bit I've heard from my mom on my genealogy. Like, I wouldn't want to tell you about that person in the line, you know. Uh, let's just not talk about them. Let's skip that. Well, those seem to be the ones that are mentioned here, you know, in some, in some regards. And so I think there's a good reason for that. And so I want to look at that. Uh, but what I want to do is talk about what these five women have in common. And, uh, and then I want to give some application for the mothers who are here today. Now, obviously, the Bible is patriarchal. You know, the Bible is written primarily from a men's perspective and written kind of about men. And so, like, obviously the world doesn't like that, and a lot of people have called the Bible, uh, uh, you know, sexist or whatever, I don't know. Uh, and, and, and the reality is, it is what it is. I mean, I hate that phrase, but you know what? Honestly, today, I know people would be mad at me for saying this, uh, not you guys, but uh, it's still a patriarchal society for the most part. Like, I don't know if people want to deny that, but for the most part, it's still men that are running. The, now, people say, talk about that like it's a bad thing. You know, oh, we got to get more women in this field, more women in that field, and, and more equality, and we got to do this and that. Like, it, it is what it is, and it's that way for a reason. And so uh, there's nothing you can really do about it. We can't just deny it and act like it's not there. But 
But the Bible is not going to lie to us. The Bible's telling us like it is, and so it's addressing uh, those types of things. And so I say that because it wouldn't normally be in this lineage that's written. It wouldn't normally be something where you see the reference on the women. You know, now obviously there's some great stories in the Bible of women. There's Bibles, uh, you know, Ruth. The whole book is named after Ruth. Another book named after Esther. And so, like, there are obviously women in the Bible. And Jesus had a lot of uh, different situations where he had conversations with women. As we're going to see in this message here in a little bit, there's a uh, women that he praises. And, uh, and so obviously God doesn't want us to be sexist in the real sense of the word, you know, and, and, and just hate women or something like that. But the reality is it, the Bible is mostly addressed to men. And I used to kind of wonder about that even whenever I was preaching, just like, hey, I'm talking to mostly women but I'm talking from the perspective because all the verses are talking about him and, and, and he and, and whatever the pronoun. Pronouns matter, okay? It's not <laughs> – it's he or she, you know? <laughs> so uh, – uh, and the Bible talks about that. And, and God is referred to in the, in the masculine. And I'm telling you, nowadays, everybody wants to get away. that they're, they, They'll talk about God and they'll say she just to, you know, for equality's sake or whatever. And then – and like that, no, there's a reason that God's done that this way. There's a reason God started uh, creation with the man, and then the woman was taken from the man, and all those kinds of things. So we understand the Bible is uh, patriarchal, and that's nothing we can do about that. But even in mentioning these women's names, notice verse three. Uh, I'll go through the I'll go through the mention of these names here. And Jude, not not every name, just the one, <laughs> just the selected verses. And Judas begat Phares and Zara of Tamar. And Phares begat uh, Ezron, and Ezron begat Aaron. So uh, what he's talking about, Judas here begat Phares and Zara, and then it says, of Tamar. In other words, Judah's still the one getting the, you know, these are his children. How did he get these children? From Tamar. So if you think about it, it's still a little uh, patriarchal in that, in that sense. Uh, look at verse 5. And Salmon, not Solomon, Salmon begat Boaz of Rahab, and Boaz begat Obed of Ruth, and Obed begat Jesse. So it's talking about Boaz, and, 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 uh, and he begat, uh, you know, he, he was with Rahab. I mean, I'm sorry. Yeah, Rahab, or it's Rahab, I guess. <laughs> Rahab, that's why it's Looks like Rachab here, and in the Old Testament it says Rahab. It's the same word, okay? It's just pronounced differently. Uh, I mean, it's because the one's Hebrew and one's Greek. So um, Boaz is born to Solomon through Rahab, and Obed is born of uh, Ruth. I mean, to to Boaz. I'm getting mixed up, but you know what I'm saying. Like it's the man's child. So he's getting the mentioned in the genealogy here. It's not like the man's not mentioned. The men are mentioned in all of these, but it's particularly pointing out, oh, yeah, by the way, you know who he married to have that child? Rahab. Now, why is that important that he points that out? It's not in Luke, but here, for whatever reason, Matthew wants to point this out. So I want to talk about why these are significant, what they have in common, and, uh, and give a little bit of application for that. Okay, so number one, um, oh, of course, uh, verse 16 also, and Jacob begat Joseph, the husband of Mary. Okay, so uh, this is a little bit of a different situation because of the fact that Mary was a virgin, so that kind of is a weird play on the, when you're talking about the genealogies of Joseph, like what is Mary, why is Mary thrown in there, you know? Well, because this is all legally through the men, so Joseph is being tied there as, even though he's the son-in-law, he's being, he's being put in into this, like, you know, uh, uh, anyway, I think, I think everybody's following what I'm saying, okay? He's not, uh, he's not obviously the blood to Jesus, but legally he's, he's Jesus' uh, father. So, <clears throat> all right, so number one, each of these five seem to be unlikely candidates for burying the lineage of 
Christ. Okay, Christ is supposed to be the king of the Jews. Isn't that what's put on his cross whenever he's uh, crucified? They put on, here's this man that's supposedly the king of the Jews. Well, he is the king of the Jews, but you know why they didn't want to accept him as the king of the Jews? Because he didn't look like he should be the king of the Jews. He didn't act like he should be the king of the Jews. Now, some people were wise enough to say, you know what, who cares about a man who's got all the money and all the power? Like, this man can turn, you know, five fish, <laughs> you know, I mean, two fish and five loaves and feed multitudes. And some people wanted to make him king for that reason. But, you know, the majority of the people, like, well, hey, he's not our king. You know, we have one king, that's Caesar. Like, they don't care about Caesar. What they're just saying is like, hey, we don't want to identify with this guy, Jesus. And so uh, it seems kind of uh, interesting that here this king of the Jews, like if Matthew is sitting there, try, if he's trying to present the genealogy of Jesus and say, here's the man who's the king of the Jews, why bring up these ladies that he brings up? Because you're not really making a great case for how uh, wonderful of a, a, a noble man that Jesus was. So first of all, let's point out um, the Gentiles, okay? These, there's a case to be made. Some people have made the case that all of these women, with the exception of Mary, I don't think there's any way uh, you can finagle that one, but all of these women are Gentiles. Again, in that culture, in that day, this would have been a really... This is not something that the Jews would have been proud of, that this, this person has all these uh, Gentiles in their, in their lineage. Okay, so um, Rahab, we know, was Jericho, you know, the walls of Jericho. Before they came down, the spies are, are spared by Rahab, the harlot, the Bible says. And so they go in there, and they're, they're hiding out, and they're trying not to be seen. And she basically says, I know you're coming here. I know your God is going to destroy this place. And will you just do me one thing? Will you spare my life and my family's life? And so they say, hey, when we come back, and God gives us the land, and we destroy these walls. Anyone who's in your house will be spared. You know the story. They, she lets down a, a scarlet thread, uh, which is... Sounds kind of symbolic, you know, the blood of Christ, and, and that's the marker that, hey, this house is, say, is will be spared when we come through to destroy it. And so Rahab, the harlot from Jericho, the Canaanite, you can say, uh, is, is spared, and then now we find later on she ends up in the genealogy of Christ. So somehow after they spared her and her family, somebody, uh, one of the Jews, married her, and from there... Uh, she is entered into the genealogy of Christ. So we understand that Rahab, we understand Ruth. She's literally called Ruth the Moabitess. And so we understand that she was from Moab. Um, we've talked a little bit about uh, Moab in our series on, on Ruth. But clearly Gentiles. Now a case has been made that Bathsheba was a Gentile. Anybody... Has anybody ever heard that or thought about that? Well, how do you, what makes you think Bathsheba's a Gentile? Well, Bathsheba was the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Okay? It would be really weird that Uriah the Hittite would come looking for, and, and then the, somebody would give their, da, their Jewish daughter to this Hittite. Uh, it's very likely that she was a Hittite as well or from some, some other place. Don't know that for sure. But the case could be made that possibly she was also a Gentile. And uh, let's see here. A case could also be made for Tamar. Uh, now, Tamar becomes a name that's used among, uh, among the Hebrews. Uh, but I've made this case here recently that I feel like some of those named that after, uh, after this woman. And that really doesn't prove anything anyway, because even if that's a Hebrew name, uh, she could have been given that name kind of given a Hebrew name. You know how somebody, in some countries, if somebody converts to Christianity, for example, they'll be given a new, like a Christian name. Like they had some uh, Abdullah, you know, something, and then they, all of a sudden they become David. You know, it has nothing, it's just a Christian name they give them. And so, like, that happens in the Bible as well. Uh, but Tamar, uh, if you remember, the story of Tamar is Judah, one of the 12 tribes of Israel, one of the 12 uh, sons, Judah, he goes and marries a Canaanite woman, or, uh, yeah, Canaanite, 
And uh, so then it says later on that he takes daughters for his, his uh, sons. Now, if he took unto himself a Canaanite woman and he's in, you know, wandering in, in, in Canaan or whatever, and he's going to find, you know, wives for his sons, it's very likely that they could have been Canaanites. Again, none of this is really matters necessarily important, but here's a case that could be made saying that all of them are Gentiles. We know for sure two of them are Gentiles. And, uh, and so the, the fact is, you know, these would have raised some eyebrows among those saying like, hey, it has to be through the line. I mean, this has to be whoever this Messiah is, whoever the king of the Jews is, it's got to be very Jewish. It's got to be, and I'll say this, it would also raise eyebrows of a lot of Zionists today. And believe it or not, a lot of Zionists today try to make everybody in that genealogy Jew somehow. And even they'll go back to like Joseph, and Joseph is giving a, given a wife from Pharaoh, and they'll say like, well, actually, there's a legend, there's a Jewish legend that says that actually she was a slave too that was taken in from, from, uh, from Judea, and then he just marries her because he's, she's Jewish, marries her to Joseph. None of that's in the Bible, right? But that's just what the Zionists want to believe, that it's all Jewish. But the reality is, in the Bible, like Jew, Gentile, it's all mixed together. It was all about the religion and who they were worshiping. And guess what? Judaism today is, not, is a false religion. It's not worshiping Jesus Christ, and it's not uh, following the Father, because the Bible says if you don't have the Son, you don't have the Father. And so, uh, and so Zionists today will also try to make it about like this, this line, this bloodline, and the reality is that's not the important message of the Bible. Okay, so not only is there, are there Gentiles, are these, some of these ladies at least, Gentiles that are added into the line, but we see that they live in poor conditions. Um, they're certainly not no, noble blood. Now, there were times, for instance, um, Solomon is a good example. His kingdom, he like added to his kingdom tons of wives. And these wives, it calls, he loved many strange women. Now, God was upset with them for that. And it wasn't so much because they weren't Jewish but it was because of the fact that they were worshiping other gods and he was adding unto like multiple wives, like 700 wives, 300 concubines. And he has all these wives and they're all from all these different strange lands and they're worshiping uh, different, different gods and stuff like that. But, you know, most of the time what would happen is a king would form some kind of alliance with another king and the way that they would do that is by getting their daughter. Now, even David is promised uh, my call from Saul. And so whenever he kind of enters into the, the noble line and he's living in the, the royal courts and all that kind of stuff, like now he's got a daughter of the king. And this was, this was important. This happens a lot in the Bible. Okay, but this isn't the case here. This is the, the lineage of Jesus Christ. And you have these people that are of, of a poor background, okay? Uh, let me, let's, let's talk about Tamar. Now, Tamar, again, Judah takes Tamar uh, to, for his son to, to, you know, to, to be his wife. But Tamar eventually is going to be a widow because Judah's son dies. And he's like, okay, I'll take care of you. You didn't have a child. I want you to be able to have a child. And so I'll give you my other son. That doesn't work out. I'll give you this other son. Doesn't, doesn't work out. And so ultimately, Tamar is left destitute. She wasn't taken care of, and she wasn't given a child. And so she decides to take it upon herself to get, a, to get a child. And so she pretends to be a harlot, pretends to be a prostitute, and covers herself up with this veil. And she knows apparently that Judah had a, a weak, he was, he was weak in this area, and uh, he catches him at the right time. He goes in unto her and thinks that she's a prostitute, and it's actually his daughter-in-law, uh, his son being now dead, but ends up... Uh, she ends up being with child from Judah. <laughs> and this is what enters into the uh, line of Christ, okay? So here's this destitute woman. She's taken to be uh, the wife of, of Judah's uh, son, but then she's left to, to be a widow. Now, by the way, widows back then, it was a bad situation to be in. If you were a widow during these times, like you would have to rely on family. You'd have to rely on 
uh, you know, ha handouts and stuff like that, and they would find different ways uh, to survive. But for the most part, if they didn't, if there wasn't a way for them to get remarried, uh, they were pretty destitute. And so in this case, that's the case with, with Tamar. And then the story that's told in the Bible is, uh, you know, that, that is remembered, and everybody knows this by the time they get to Matthew and they read that Tamar's in the genealogy, they know, hey, that's that one that tricked her father-in-law into having a child with her. But she's in the genealogy of Jesus Christ. Rahab is literally called the harlot. Rahab the harlot. Now, I would assume that she gave up that practice when she <laughs> married a, a Jew and she got plugged in and worshiped God. I would assume that she gave that up, but you know, the Bible continues to call her that until the very end of the Bible. And so, uh, this is certainly not a situation where you want to be proud of that. Hey, this is the king of the Jews, Jesus, and you could trace his line, and there's wonderful women in there like Rahab the harlot. I mean, that's just not something that you would expect to find in the genealogy. Ruth, we've been talking about the story, but here's this Moabitess woman who, again, is widowed and following along her mother-in-law, who is also widowed, and they're coming back in complete poverty into Bethlehem, Judah, begging, basically, for food. Like, hey, whatever, whatever, uh, you will go glean in the fields, and whatever, they, after they glean the fields, they left some stuff on the ground. We'll go get that stuff so that we can live another day. That's how destitute she was. And uh, so <clears throat> these women are not necessarily in the best uh, standing in society. You know, they're not the no nobility that you would expect from a king or a king. Now, we live in 21st century, but I don't think this is anything new. Uh, we also live in a generation of Hollywood and fairy tales and lots of books and, and uh, fantasies and, and stuff like that. And uh, I hate to say this, but we live in a land of uh, Hallmark movies. <laughs> I'm sorry if you've ever watched one of those, but <laughs> and so here's what the poor what, girls grow up, and they're in a poor family, and they're kind of the outcast, and nobody pays them attention. You know what they dream of? They dream that some rich man who just happens to be rich and charming. And handsome, those three don't usually go together. Okay, that's like the triad. That's the that's the <laughs> you're not gonna find it probably. You just settle with one or the other, okay? Choose which one. <laughs> and uh, but in the fantasy world, man, that person is rich and they're handsome and they're charming, and just the perfect, perfect guy. And they dream, they fantasize that one day a uh, knight in shining armor is gonna come and and take me away. Now, we understand that's probably not going to happen. That's probably not reality. Uh, now, you can call your husband your knight in shining armor or your, your prince or whatever. He's not, but you can call him that. And, uh, <laughs> but listen to this. Aren't you glad that Jesus Christ, the king of kings, the king of the world, <laughs> you know, the... You know, we are, I don't want to be called a princess, okay? Don't, don't call me a princess, but we are the bride of Christ. We're engaged to be married to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Aren't you glad he didn't look to see what blood you had? You know, were you born from the right area? Do you have the right connections? Aren't you glad he didn't check your bank account to make sure how you had the right amount of money or you had the right connections? And, and, uh, and, and, and no, look at this, Revelation chapter 20. Revelation 20. Let's start in verse 11. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heavens fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, that's talking about 
wealthy, well-known people, and then the insignificant, poor people, and everywhere in between. I saw the small and great stand before God, and the books were open, and another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the book of life according to their works. Oh, see, so he does look at your works. He does want to know how noble you are and how good you are to be saved. Nope, keep reading. And the seas gave up the dead that were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every man, according to their works. And death and hell was cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. You know what that means? Whoever was found written in the book of life was not cast into the lake of fire. Who is written in the book of life? Those people who have entered into a contract relationship with Jesus Christ, known as the bride of Christ, you know, known as the church, his bride, we entered into that legal contract. Those people, it has nothing to do with your works, how great you are, how good you are. Those people who want to be judged according to the works, they'll be judged according to their works. None of them are going to be good enough for the King of kings and the Lord of lords. But God has created this uh, program, if you will, where he's going to show mercy on all those, and he's going to show grace on all those who receive Jesus Christ and his righteousness. And all these stories about Ruth and Rahab and all these wonderful stories about people whose lives were messed up, people who didn't fit the bill, they didn't really meet the qualifications in society's eyes, but you know what? God found favor and said, I got you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cover you. You're going to be part of Now I know it sounds weird to talk about marrying Jesus and all of us are going to be married as like polygamy or something like that. No. All, actually, the, what God set up is what's, is, is what's the perfect standard, okay? And then what we, what we do following what God set up for the laws of marriage or whatever is only a slight picture of what, what he has. So it's not like we can look at Jesus' relationship with us and be like, ooh, that's weird. No, it's right, <laughs> okay? Everything else is only a slight picture of that. If, I don't know if that makes sense to you or not, but, uh, but don't think it's weird, okay? Don't think, I'm not going to call myself a princess, but don't think it's weird that I'm saying, like, hey, I'm the bride of Christ. I'm getting married to Jesus Christ or something like that. Uh, because that's good and right. It's not uh, the weird kind of sexual thing that we make it uh, in our flesh. All right, and not only, and this goes right in hand with what I just shared, but uh, you'll go in the next chapter, uh, Revelation 21. Not only is it not the best situation as far as uh, birth, you know, hey, these people were Gentiles, these people were born into poverty, poor conditions. But I've already kind of alluded to this to a little bit, but all of them could have easily been spoken of in a negative light. But they went on to honor the Lord. Okay, so, so each of them had something that they could have pointed to. And again, there's a little bit of a, you'd have to stretch a little bit on some of these, but let me give you an example. Now, Tamar, we already discussed, we know what she did wrong in luring her father-in-law to give her a child, no matter how you try to justify that or say, like, yeah, well, he was worse than she was or whatever. No, it was still wrong what she did. Okay, and anybody who knew this story, anyone that talked about her knew what the sin was. They knew what she had done wrong, and they could talk, you know, oh, you're married to Tamar. Hey, isn't she the one that, you know what I'm saying? Like, your grandma was Tamar. Uh, there, no matter what, there was... A, occasion for them to be able to bring up an evil report about her and to talk about her in an evil light, no matter what she had done uh, after that, but continued to go on and serve the Lord after that. <clears throat> we know, again, that Rachel, I mean, not Rachel, Rahab was called a harlot. And it seems, um, Again, that, that name, that title continued on even after she got married and entered into uh, the line of Christ or, or, or into the Jewish uh, family because, you know, she continues to be called that. Even into the book of James, it's, it's Rahab the harlot and, and all that. So, like, everybody knew that story. They knew that mindset. And, again, the in-laws and the 
grandkids and everybody like knows her as this person. They know that story. And what about Ruth and Bathsheba? <clears throat> now, I have read different commentaries, and I've heard things preached different ways and, and all that. And so let me say real quickly, just in passing, like none of these, again, these aren't things that are necessarily in the Bible. People could stretch these a little bit. But I have heard people say, well, Ruth wasn't all that innocent because she went in, if you remember, at nighttime into Boaz, you know, spread your skirt over me and all this. And I've heard people say that what she was doing was, was, was pretty, uh, you know, not, not accepted. It wasn't, a, it wasn't a good godly woman thing to do, okay? Now, regard, regardless of whether you believe that or not, I'm just saying that view is out there. Some people think like what she was doing wasn't good. And then in the morning, it's just kind of, hey, leave before anybody could know that you were here. And, uh, and so some people have brought up that kind of accusation, like, hey, that wasn't necessarily a good thing. Bathsheba, you know, some people have this idea that she was actually out there. Uh, David was up on the rooftop, and she knew he was watching, and she was kind of enticing him. And, 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 you know, it was, a, it was just a, a, what do you talk about, a mutual lust that they had for each other. And, you know, we don't really know, but we understand the sin that happened. We understand the, adult, the adulterous affair that happened there. And so, therefore, uh, all of these people could have bad things said about them. And let me just say for application here, you know, you don't have to be, you don't have to be guilty of something to have a bad rep reputation. Now, it's a, it's a shame but the Bible says that death and life are in the power of the tongue. I mean, all someone has to do is say something against you. And, you know, hey, if, it, if, you're, if you're somebody and the media says it, then everybody's going to believe it, for, an exa for example. And all they have to do is say something and accuse you of something or have something in your past, and they can destroy you, and you'll forever be known as that person that did X, Y, Z. And so we really don't know how guilty Bathsheba was. We really don't know, like, did Ruth actually have any bad motives there? Or, or, you know, but people could say things about that. And so at some point, of course, we're all sinners. Probably not too much people could accuse me of that. I can't be like, hey, you want some more dirt? I mean, I, I did a whole lot worse than that. You want me to tell you? Uh, I'm not going to, but, <laughs> you know, we're all sinners. And well, there's, all, there's bad things that we've all done. But even if uh, you're getting accused of things that you didn't do, like the reality is, you know, we, we understand that we all, we all have sin. Mary likely had accusations said about her, don't you think? I mean, here's this woman, she's great with child, and uh, like, hey, wait a minute, they're not even married yet. What is she doing? What, you know, that got spread around. There's a case where uh, the Pharisees turn to Jesus, and Jesus is kind of rebuking them for something, and they say, they say, hey, we weren't born in fornication. Now, it depends on how you interpret what they're saying. In, the, in that context, you might be able to make it say something else. But either way, I really sense that when they said that, they were like, hey, hey, you're the one that was born in fornication, not us. And so we know that he wasn't born in fornication, but that could be the testimony that was told about Mary, who was with child before they were ever, she was ever married. And so, uh, and so these could be the types of things that happened. Now, if you're in Revelation 21, look at verse 8. I already talked about great and small, okay? The wealthy and the poor, like all these are, um, you know, none of those are hindrances from us being able to go to heaven and be the bride of Christ. But look at Revelation 21, verse 8. But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers, and sorcerers, and idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Now, when I read that, it looks to me like, uh, you know, hey, nothing, <coughs> excuse me, nothing evil, nothing sinful is going to be in heaven. Only that which is pure and holy, okay? And that's true. That's true. This is why it, does, it makes no sense for people to think that their works have any part in getting to heaven because the Bible says in James, if you offend in one point of the law, you're guilty of it all. You, like, you still broke the law. 
He was like, oh, well, you can ask forgiveness. Well, you still bro- you're still not perfect. And so you can't get to heaven because you fit into this category, all right? So this is why it makes no sense when people are relying on turning from their sins or, or ceasing to sin or just doing these good works to impress God because it's never going to impress God. It's like filthy rags. We say, well, how do you get to heaven then? Here's how you get to heaven. You're married to Christ. Here's how you get to heaven. Your name is written down in the book of life. God no longer sees you, sees those sins as part of you. He sees you as clean, spotless, and this is the case with, with this gene- genealogy. See, these people who had a bad reputation, they didn't seem to be people who should have been accepted into that line, but guess what? They were married into it, and now they're seen as part of the line of Christ. Same with us, except for ours would be the line of Christ after Christ died on the cross instead of before he died on the cross, all right? Go to Matthew 26. I just want to finish with this one thought. Matthew 26. Here's an interesting thing, though. All of these women that are in this lineage of Christ, we know who they are. Like, their story has already been told. It's not like a name's just mentioned in the genealogy. We're like, oh, who's that woman? No, the reason it's put there is because we already know something about it. They're in the Bible. Like, they, their, their story's already been told. Uh, it's, it's, it's being remembered. Okay, and so the stories are remembered. That's the last point is that, you know, all of these women, they seem like unlikely candidates. Okay, they didn't fit the bill of those who would be in there. And they, they, were, they could be spoken of in negative light. They weren't necessarily, like I'll say this about Mary, because the Catholic view of Mary is that she is sinless. And, she, and not only was she sinless, they say that she was born uh, uh, born sinless, like the Immaculate Conception, that's, that's in reference to Mary. They say that she was born with no sin, just completely, and she never sinned after that or whatever. No, I'm sorry, that's just not true. She was a sinner like everybody else. Now, the Bible might not record some great sins that she did, because what's the point of talking about it? But the reality is she has sinned, okay? And so, uh, so she is remembered as this great woman, the mother of Jesus Christ, but you know what? The only reason she went to heaven is because of the fact that she had faith in Jesus Christ and she's a part of this this lineage of Christ as well. Okay, their stories are remembered though and it seems to me an interesting thing in this patriarchal society, the patriarchal book, patriarchal world, you know, um, there are a lot of women who Jesus recognizes, who, who the Bible recognizes. And I want you to see this in Matthew 26 because this is just one of those precious stories where you see Jesus honoring women who love him and, and uh, continue to follow him. Again, in that society, you remember when he was at the, talking to the woman at the well and the disciples came and they're just kind of like, what's he doing talking to her? And she's even like, what are you doing? I'm a, I'm a woman, I'm a Samaritan, and I'm a woman. And he's like, you know, offering eternal life to her right then and there. Well, that Jesus does that. And, you know, to those women who follow the Lord, God wants to recognize them. Now, here's the thing. The world might not recognize you. But really, that's not important. God's going to see to it that you are recognized. I know I've got this uh, kind of... uh, fantasy, I guess, in my mind that I, I, I play out every once in a while, that in the millennial kingdom, there's like this other book or some kind of record that's like another Bible. I'm not saying it really is going to happen, okay, so don't quote me on this. It's just a fantasy that I kind of have, that in the millennial kingdom, there will be this other Bible, this other book, not the Book of Mormon, <laughs> this other book, and the book is going to have a list of all these names. It's like everything that happened like after Jesus Christ, again, just in, just in my mind, okay? In the, in the millennial kingdom, people are going to be talking about these characters and all that. And so I often think, like, hey, what if that is a possibility that that would happen? Like, would my name be written in that book? And if it was written in that book, what would it say about me? You know what I mean? What are people going to think about me? And, uh, and, and so I would want my story to be remembered. Well, Jesus says this. Look at Matthew chapter 26. And we'll start in verse 6. 
Now when Jesus was in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, there came unto him a woman having an alabaster box of very precious ointment and poured it on his head as he sat at meat. But when his disciples saw it, they had indignation saying, to what purpose is this waste? And we understand from comparing Scripture to Scripture that it was Judas uh, who was actually the ringleader of this conversation. Hey, we could have sold this for the, uh, and gave it to the poor, but uh, it says in verse 9, for this ointment might have been sold for much and given to the poor. When Jesus understood it, he said unto them, Why trouble ye the woman? For she hath wrought a good work upon me. For ye have the poor always with you, but me ye have not always. For in that she hath poured this ointment on my body, she did it for my burial. Verily I say unto you, wheresoever this gospel shall be preached in the whole world, there shall also this that this woman hath done be told for a memorial of her. And I was studying this out one time, and what I realized was all four, I'm pretty sure I'm right on this, all four books of uh, gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, all have the story of this woman. I'm not saying every time somebody preaches the gospel, like I preach the gospel a lot, I don't always mention this woman, but everybody, the most people are familiar with this story when, it's, when you're just reading it and you're telling the gospel. All four gospels have the story of this. You know how many gospels have the story of Lazarus being risen from the dead? One, John. The gospel of John. That's a pretty cool thing. That's a pretty amazing thing. But Jesus was like, you know what? This woman right here, every time this gospel is preached, like this woman is going to be remembered. She's going to be memorialized in my book because she, you know, did this to me and she worshiped at my feet. And so, you, as a, a, a anybody, this applies to everybody, but of course, it's Mother's Day and we're talking about women in the genealogy. So, Women, you might feel sometimes like you don't get the recognition that you deserve. Now, the world wants you to recognize the women, and actually, the world likes to go to extremes. And so, like, you know, it's not just, hey, let's recognize black people as much as white people. It's like, hey, no, now we got to recognize black people and forget about white people, you know. And not, it's just like everything's extremes. It's like, why, why don't we just be right and fair, you know, give credit where credit is due? But no, the world's like, no, now we got to, Put women on a pedestal and forget men. Men are, men are scum, you know. No, but I will agree that there are a lot of women who get no recognition when, in fact, their husbands wouldn't be who they are without the woman. <laughs> you know, I remember that old joke about the president who went to the, uh, he took his wife on, uh, to a dinner and, and uh, he saw his wife talking to the, this man and, and, and had this long conversation. He was kind of getting jealous. And when she got back to the table, he said, who is that man? He was like bussing tables, you know. And he was like, well, you know what? I dated this man a long time ago, and I almost married him. And then the president started laughing, and he was like, isn't that something? If you would have married him, you know what I mean? You'd be the wife of a, of a restaurant bus boy. But you married me, the president of the United States. And she said, no, if I would have married him, he'd be the president of the United States. <laughs> and that's true a lot of times. Like, the, how many pastors, like, they would not be who they are and be able to get what they get done if it wasn't for the wife. Guess what? Maybe in this world she will get no recognition. Maybe, you know, the husband won't recognize her like he should. Maybe society won't recognize her like he should. But God's watching. And we know that Jesus is in the business of saying, you serve me, you love me. I want you to be memorialized. And, uh, and so that's all we need to worry about, loving the Lord, serving him, and don't worry about your past. Don't worry about uh, where you came from, how little you have, how much you have. None of that's important. It's what you do for Christ. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word, and I thank you for all the mothers here and the women uh, that are here, and all of us, Lord, who have received Jesus Christ. I pray that you will help us just to uh, um, recognize how fortunate we are to be uh, the bride of Christ and, and to have our eternity secured uh, sitting at the table with Jesus Christ. I pray that you'll uh, just help us to um, never lose sight of that and to continue in joy as we think on that. Father, be glorified in all that's done today, and I pray you would uh, um, help to recognize our, our uh, mothers uh, on this special day. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.